Antarctica is a pretty cold place nowadays. Mostly covered with ice, at least that's what they say. However, when I get the uh, National Geographic magazine from October 1947, our Navy explorers Antarctica, Richard Byrd went down there, of course, and found all kinds of land which was not covered with ice. It was dry land, ice-free. The water was not frozen. They were able to land their airplanes right there on uh, uh, freshwater lakes that were not frozen. And there's hundreds and hundreds of square miles described in this issue of, of on frozen land, ice-free, including lakes. But mostly Antarctica is definitely the coldest place on Earth. It's a lot colder than the North Pole. And if we study history and uh, maps and books, we'll find out that it looks like Antarctica used to be a really hot place. In fact, it was so hot, nobody could even go there. And it may have been so hot that the sun at sunrise could strike you dead instantly. So the, all of that's going to be covered in this video. I'm going to start with uh, Charles Hapgood, Map of the Ancient Sea Kings. And that's another book right here. I've read thoroughly, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff in this book. Now, Charles Hapgood was a friend of Einstein, and uh, Einstein agreed with him on a lot of his theories, such as the Earth's shifting crust. Now, this is a sphere Earth theory that the Earth's crust shifts, and that, of course, causes the continents to move or a pole shift. But a shifting crust could also work on a flat Earth. There's no reason it wouldn't. And some of these, you know, books, Great Mysteries of Earth, The Path to the Pole, some really good books from Charles Hapgood. Take it with a grain of salt because, you know, Charles Hapgood was a friend of Einstein. And we do know that Einstein was shady, uh, at least around his controversy with Albert Michelson and special relativity. But I want to dive into this book. This book really, uh, Map of the Agent Seekings, it's a study of more or less of the Pyrees map and of a lot of other maps but the Pyrees map specifically, because the Pyrees map looks like it shows Antarctica's coastline mapped with no ice. And the question is, how did this map get created? How were they able to map the land of Antarctica's coastline? Because nowadays we just, in the last 50 years, have been able to scan through the ice to see the land. And that's the only way we can map it. However... People of the ancient past on this 1513 map looks like they were able to map the uh, land of Antarctica. And that's what a lot of the book here, Map of the Ancient Sea Kings, is about. But these two pages show what they have interpreted as the landmarks of the Antarctic coastline. And I've studied this, and I, I don't agree with that 100%. Let me go ahead and pull up a Photoshop here with the Pyrees map. And I'm going to start off by translating the text that's right here. So this part of the map is marked by seven, as we can see here. And here's the translation, which is talking about the Portuguese infidels. So it's important to note that Pyrees didn't actually sell all of these coastlines. He took his boat out and went to all different areas of the earth, including South America and spoke with the local people there, traded with them a lot of times to get maps from them. And then from all these maps, they would uh, put, put them together into a complete world map. So when they're talking about Portuguese infidels, that is when they were speaking with the native South Americans. And it's related by these that in this spot, night and day are at their shortest of two hours and at their longest of 22 hours. But the day is very warm and the night there is much dew. So we know that at VII, the location of this, there's two hours of sunlight at the shortest day and the longest day is 22 hours of sunlight. From that, we can determine the longitude of this location. Now, there is an equation for determining based on your latitude, not longitude, but latitude, how many hours of sunlight you'll have. And more importantly, there's a nice image here to show it. Now, the Antarctic Circle and the Arctic Circle are the barriers of the midnight sun. So north of here, you have midnight sun, and south of here, you have midnight sun, 24 hours of sunlight, or uh, zero hours of sunlight. 
and I do believe that actually happens. I have not seen the Midnight Sun with my own eyes, but what I did do was after reading Amundsen's South Pole books, I noticed that he had an observation book where he kept all of his sextant readings from when he was at the South Pole. So I emailed the uh, library in Norway where Amundsen's field journal was located that, and they were able to go ahead and scan his field journal for me. This is from the South Pole book, and this is a, a section of his field journal where he had kept all of the sextant readings from when he was at the South Pole in 1911. So uh, Oda here was able to find the book and get it scanned. So this is the physical book that Amundsen had you know, in his pack when he was sledging with the dogs to the South Pole, the first human to ever get there in 1911. And we can see it was at on his page 169 where he was at the South Pole. So going all the way, you know, south to the South Pole here as he's uh, taking various calculations. Here we are at the South Pole on the 17th of December 1911. And this, of course, all lines up with all the historical accounts of Amundsen being there. And on this page, you can see the 1 through 12 hours and 1 through 12. So for a 24-hour period, they stayed directly at 90 degrees south and took sextant readings once per hour. And we can see the sun traveling overhead at a 46-degree angle. And it moved a tiny bit, but pretty much they were right square at 46 degrees with the sun circling around them. I believe Amundsen's account, and this is the one and only description of a midnight sun that I truly and honestly believe is fact. Amundsen, as well as the three other men with him, signed this, uh, stating that this is true and honest. Um, this was the hardcore evidence that they had actually made it to the South Pole location. So I do think that the midnight sun south of the Antarctic Circle and north of the Arctic Circle is a is an actual phenomenon that happens but let's identify the let's identify the latitude where we have two hours and 22 hours of sunlight 60 degrees south we get all the way up to six hours so we're below six uh, 60 degrees south but it's a little bit north of 66 degrees south so this location uh, at six hours is going to be much closer to the Antarctic Circle. Um, maybe just a hair north of the Antarctic Circle because at the Antarctic Circle you will have a 24-hour midnight sun. And when we read this description, they're saying that the shortest of two and the longest of 22. Therefore, this means it is a location that is just north of the Antarctic Circle probably around where this line right here is at. You might have a two hour day here. So switching back to Photoshop, we could see that that's where this is written at. So this is very close to the Antarctic Circle or, and probably just a hair north of the Antarctic Circle. And I'm gonna go ahead and overlay it now with a map of Antarctica, which I believe is all the uh, land lines up correctly. And this map comes from Rima, which is probably the best map of Antarctica out there. But the funny thing on this map is when you zoom in, I have the satellite imagery turned on. And you can see these little, you know, patches of, of satellite picture that have been taken or airplane picture that have been taken. And you're going to notice that all of the photos stop directly at 85 degrees south. It is, it, I, it is classified south of 85 degrees, uh, or maybe it just doesn't exist, period. But um, there are no photos allowed of south of 85 degrees. We can see that plain as day on this Rima map. And it's also quite obvious on the Google map when you look. I've talked about this before, but you can see how the stretching of the um, Queen Maud mountain range here is or the trans antarctic mountains whatever you want to call them i call them the queen mon mountain range that's that's their proper name um as, as per richard bird anyways but you can see how the pixels have been stretched so far you know down here you just get a mess 
and when you go up this way the closer you get to the edge it actually is you know pretty pretty good imagery up here but as you go south this imagery gets worse and worse and worse and there's only one mountain range showing on Google Maps the Queen Maud mountain range that is such a ridiculous lie read some uh, facts about Antarctica like this or Little America by Richard Bird or Discovery by Richard Bird or Alone by Richard Bird and you will learn that this is one of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mountain ranges we only get to see one of them on Google Maps and when you scroll into 85 degrees south you don't get to see anything these are just uh, pixels that are being stretched like this towards the center and uh, they don't do that over here on the Antarctic Rima map they just play, they just flat out stop so quite interesting that no pictures are allowed south of 85 degrees and this is the source for this map that I have which shows the elevation and we could see the land underneath of the ice and that's what these black uh, lines are representing it is the land that's beneath the ice so I'm gonna to toggle this off and we can you know kinda of follow the coastline here and you get this curve here a flat area going south there's an island and then the land kinda of goes back up north under this uh, peninsula and let's toggle this back on I'm gonna turn the opacity down on it and I'm also gonna show the Antarctic Circle I've gone ahead and put the Antarctic Circle here where I think it should be which again we're just a hair north of the Antarctic Circle right here where there's two hours of sunlight so this seems to be the correct location for the Antarctic Circle alright and let's toggle on Antarctica here from the Rima map and I'm gonna just move the opacity down and uh, bring it back up so the first thing here is we have South America this land of South America is quite easy to identify and this area right here is interesting it looks like it is the this area right here it looks like this used to be a connected land bridge and over time the water has pushed you know all the land out this way and caused the hu uh, you know a, the separation of 600 miles here between the tip of South America and Antarctica about 600 miles between there but it does look like it used to be connected and that is essentially what we're seeing on this map right here that the land coming down here is connected and at one point it was a land bridge from South America to Antarctica so toggling the opacity up for the map that we currently have we have this section here which has this crescent moon shape and it seems like that matches up pretty good with this crescent moon shape that's right here and then it goes on to you know it kind of flattens out here and it has this flat looking area here and it's not a hundred percent flat on the Antarctica map but it does come out and you know kind of goes flat here and follows the you know a contour this way Toggling the Antarctica map down. You can see that it goes down like this and it comes back up. So there are some pretty good similarities. The main difference is that this kind of comes up pretty high here before it comes back down. And on this map, it's more of a small bump down here. But other than that, this island appears, and that's also we have an island here so when I line up this portion of Antarctica with the Pyrees map it looks like what Pyrees may have been mapping is we have South America going with the land bridge connecting it here and then it goes straight into Antarctica the area here being that there's only two hours of sunlight and we have the dip in with the island and all of the same topographic features that we see from this map so quite interesting that uh, I don't know if this is you know just coincidental or what but it seems as though the Pyrees map is actually mapping the land of Antarctica coastline versus the ice frozen coastline where, where nowadays 
you know, the sea ice goes out to, to here. And this is where we get into some of the information about it being quite hot there. We're going to look down at this area of the map here. We, we get the down here by the X. And let's zoom in on the map and look at it. It almost looks like it's been erased, but you have a snake down here. And it kind of looks like a dragon. You know, it hard to tell. It's fading or almost been erased. But you can see the snake down here, and there's some text. And that text, we can read it here. This is area 10, of course. So going to 10, we can see this country is a waste. And we're talking about Antarctica. Everything is in ruin. And it's said that large snakes are found here. For this reason, the Portuguese infidels did not land on these shores. And they are also said to be very hot. Now that seems pretty strange that Antarctica is very hot and we have snakes, large snakes it says. Uh, large snakes are found here. From the British Antarctic Survey collecting fossils in Antarctica and you can see this doesn't look all that cold. Dry land with no ice again and they're dinosaur hunting down there in Antarctica. Antarctica today is cold in a hospital desert. However, in the distant past, the climate was much warmer, and they found all kinds of fossils. Here is a sketch from what Antarctica probably looked like, and they say 120 million years ago, but somehow we have maps from around 500 to 1,000 years ago that are showing the ice-free land. Somehow they mapped it. Almost everything you collect in Antarctica represents a fossil animal or plant that was previously unknown to science. So almost every fossil that they're finding in Antarctica, we didn't even, we've never even known they existed. Unknown species. Huge trove of dinosaur fossils found in Antarctica. 71 million. Some old bones could reveal new clues on how they went extinct. Scientists have found more than a ton of dinosaur bones in Antarctica. So we know from fossil record that it is a fact that Antarctica used to be hot and that there was a lot of life there including dinosaurs. Now I'm going to switch over to the Urbano Monet map and we have some very interesting stuff on this map. The first thing to notice is that when we go south of South America we get almost a land bridge. It looks like there's a little bit of a river here coming through it or a uh, straight and this is called Tierra del Fuego now that's translated into land of the fire so another hint that Antarctica is extremely hot and it makes sense they would call it Tierra del Fuego when the Portuguese people say that the country is in ruin and it is also said to be very hot and that's likely where this name Tierra del Fuego came from Urbano Monet colored this land red, which seems to correspond with, with hot or heat. And the interesting thing when we look at the Urbano Monet map is we find dinosaurs. Now, the first dinosaur wasn't discovered until George Washington died. And so they wouldn't have been, a, you know, they didn't have fossils to theorize what dinosaurs would have looked like. They would have had to actually see the the dinosaur to know what it looked like. Here we have a pterodactyl carrying an elephant and going over here dinosaur looking creature could be a lizard but now we get into some unmistakable dinosaurs here we've got the triceratops and if not a triceratops it certainly is one of those dinosaurs that had you know one of those shields around it you could kinda of see the same exact type of animal here or one of these dinosaurs again that had the, you know, had the uh, that shield up here as part of his skull, and over here looking like again another dinosaur. This one looks, you know, like one of these guys right here. Uh, another one up here in this area. We can see this guy right here, and uh, I don't know what's going on here. It looks like some kind of a bear, but you got this guy right here, which. You know, I don't know what this is. Some kind of a serpent. It certainly uh, lines up with 
you know how they're saying that there are large snakes it is said that there are large snakes found here a large snake is easily translated into a dinosaur so not too surprising that uh, Urbano Monet has put dinosaurs located in Antarctica and scientists are finding Antarctica to be a treasure trove of dinosaur fossils no coincidence there neither the naming of Tierra de Fuego being called the land of the fire when we know at one point it was probably too hot to go there and so hot or so many dinosaurs that the Portuguese infidels did not land on these shores and to this day we don't land on those shores too often because now of the cold but at one point it seemed to be quite hot now switching over to a very interesting book called the Vinland map and the Tartar relation the Vinland map shows all kinds of Tartarian lands the Tartarian Sea some kind of Tartars up here the uh, Imperium Tartarium Thule here which is interesting that sounds like it's connected to the Thule society from uh, the pre-Nazi Germany area but all kinds of Tartaria you know all over this map and there are Greenland and we've got sections of America over here called Vinland so this is the Vinland map and there is this is the book the Vinland map and the Tar Tartar relation or the Tartarian relation and let's go ahead and read this is a historical account of the Tartarians and very interesting book at times I'm not sure if I'm reading uh, fiction or not but if this goes back 2,000 years it's hard to say what was happening at the year 200 or 300 this is a complete history of the Tartarian people now in previous videos I've talked about the connections between the Tartarian people being the lost in tribes of Israel and there are some more hints of that in this book and the Jews here called Gog and Magog so that's one interesting thing to note but let's get on here to where they had been traveling north for three more months through the desert and he ordered them as food was running out to eat one man out of every tent so they had to do some cannibalism and after these three months they came to the great mountains in a country called Naragan that is the men of the sun for Nara is Tartar for sun and Igrin means men so these are the men of the sun uh, way far north by the North Pole fighting trodden trackways but no inhabitants he and his men began to mar marvel exceedingly soon after he found a single native and his wife and proceeded to ask him through numerous interpreters where the men of the country were he learned that they dwell in underground homes beneath the mountains and sent the captured man keeping the woman still prisoner to ask if they were willing to come out and fight while the man was on his way back day broke and the Tartars threw themselves face downward on the ground at the noise of the rising sun and many of them died on the spot the natives of the country saw the enemy and made a night attack on them killing a number of Tartars and seeing that Chinggis Khan fled with the survivors but took the captive wife with him nevertheless so we're going over to five here and some similar Sun legends are widespread but are told usually of the setting Sun Germany uh, chapter 45 writes so far truly of the midnight sun over the frozen sea north of Sweden so bright that it extinguishes the stars and adds that the natives say it makes a loud noise when setting Chinese story of Sapachi the land where the Sun sets which no one has ever visited except Alexander the Great and in the evening when the Sun set the sound is like thunder the king of the country each evening gathers a thousand person in the city wall to blow horns sound gongs and beat drums to alleviate the sound of the Sun otherwise little, little children would die of fright other useful parallels from eastern sources including a story that the three magni come from a country so far east that the people were born deaf from the noise of the sunrise the theme of the sun's noise is evidently related to the mongol practice recorded by rubric of sounding drums and instruments and making a great noise and clamor during an eclipse of the sun a custom is also found in china and tibet in alexander romance the natives of the land of the sunrise take refuge like the people of Naragan, in underground homes beneath the mountain at sunrise or lie with their faces to the ground as do Chinggis Khan's men as a protection from heat not the noise so it seems to be a little confusion about whether or not it's 
the heat that's killing them or if it's the noise that's killing them. But something about this sunrise s seems quite ridiculous when you get apparently close to the poles. As the Tartar themselves told the friars, the captive woman stayed with them for a long time and asserted that without a shadow of a doubt, the aforesaid country is situated at the very end of the world and beyond it, no land is found, but only ocean sea. Wherever owning to the excessive proximity of the sun when it rises over the sea at that point of summer sunrise, a crashing and roaring of such a nature and magnitude is heard there due to the opposition of the sun and the firmament. And no one dares to live in the open air or on the surface until the sun proceeds through its zodiac to the south for fear of dying instantly or being wounded as if struck by lightning. For this reason, the natives bear drums and instruments in their mountain caves in order to shut out the noise of the sun with the sound of their drumming. This country is flat and fertile after the mountains are crossed, but not large. So, I don't know. I've never heard of this before, but here we have an account that the sun at sunrise or sunset is so loud and or so hot that it instantly is killing people and instantly killing a bunch of these Tartarian soldiers who were you know, near the verge of starvation. So multiple sources from historical maps to historical books from multiple countries all over the world reporting that at the ends of the earth near the north of the South Pole, there, you know, is, there's that really hot sun and perhaps a very loud sun as the be, due to the opposition of the sun and the firmament so i don't know when antarctica may get hot again maybe it's it's becoming more hot right now and that's why richard bird is finding these areas in antarctica that are completely unfrozen i'm wondering if this uh south of 85 degrees if there's any ice there at all because Again, you would be real close to the sun, and if you get close to 90 degrees south, and all of a sudden, at sunrise or sunset, it almost kills you, or it's hot, then there would be no ice here. That could be one reason why there's no uh, pictures allowed south of 85 degrees. And finally, I'm going to wrap up with a passage here from Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. I uh, might as well flip to it on the screen. Now, this chapter is certainly talking about the Tartarian people, a civilization that vanished. The evidence presented by ancient maps appear to suggest that the existence in remote times, before the rise of any known cultures, a true civilization of an advanced kind, which was not localized in one area, but had worldwide commerce and was in a real sense a worldwide culture. And when you look at star forts, such as the one that the Statue of Liberty is sitting on, you'll realize that there definitely was the Tartarians with their star fort architecture and their elegant architecture were definitely advanced in geodesy, nautical science, and map making. It was more advanced than any known culture before the 18th century of the Christian era. Now, my book actually says something different. Uh, so I suggest the newer version of uh, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Let me read you what it says here. The, they may have well been more advanced than the civilizations of Egypt, Barcelona, Greece, and Rome in uh, astronomy, nautical science, map making, and possibly shipbuilding. Now it's quite interesting that he's mentioning shipbuilding here because I've mentioned before in previous videos these strange Tartarian boats that we seem to have photographs and paintings of, which don't have sails, they don't have a stack for the uh, smoke from an engine, yet they're somehow traveling about the sea with no problem. They have these two strange masts with some kind of circular or, or you know, some kind of something up here. Um, I, I think this, you know, maybe it's magnetic. Maybe this is a positive and a, and a negative magnetic. I, I don't know what these are, They but they don't have cells. There is no uh, stack coming up with, with the smoke coming out, which means there's no engine running the boat. And you would expect a boat like this with the cells 
and you end up with these boats with no sails and no engines somehow seemingly to travel about the ocean with no problem so it's interesting that the um, that the book here says that they were an advanced civilization more advanced than all all the other civilizations in map making and possibly shipbuilding certainly he is talking about the Tartarian people in this civilization that vanished I've got to get to 90 degrees north and 90 degrees south because I want to find out if the sun is still still does what it did back then if it still makes loud noise and uh, might even kill you if you you know don't hide yourself underground or w with your face to the ground so very interesting stuff from these old books and uh, very interesting that we don't get to see what is in the location where these phenomena happen so thank you for watching I've got uh, more interesting things on the horizon whether it's flat or curved so i'll see you guys then